alarming. sense of dread in the air. Suddenly a faint noise is heard from the other side of the room, causing Pavel to freeze in his tracks. His eyes widen in fear as he slowly turns his head towards the source of the sound. Pavel? A voice calls out softly, breaking the silence and adding to the suspense of the scene. The camera cuts to a close-up of Pavel's face, his expression a mix of fear and determination as he prepares to confront whatever or whoever is approaching. So, that's it. I'm live, right? Friends, hello everyone. Well, let's start our already traditional webinar on the new investment project from Solar Group, the next generation airships. Today we will talk about airships again, discussing how this project is developing today and what results we have. And of course, we will talk about the technology itself. In particular, today we will discuss the certification of airships. This has also been asked about frequently. And before we begin, I kindly ask you to like this broadcast subscribe to our social networks, whether you are watching on YouTube or vContact, so you don't miss our future broadcasts. And please make sure to share this. A simple action like a repost is often underestimated by some people, but with just one very simple click, you can indeed very significantly increase the number of us here in the broadcast right now. I want to thank you all for your activity. We are still in a very preliminary stage, yet we have quite good results and many people are following us, even though our social networks and websites are still in a very nascent, one could say, state. By the way, some partners even write to me saying, look, I have more views on my YouTube channel than you do, more subscribers. In fact, indeed, this is beneficial because we have active partners who are developing their own resources as well. It is not just the official resources that help promote and develop this project. Furthermore, this is why we are able to achieve the results we have today. By the way, this is also a note for the other partners, those who are currently considering the project. Remember that there are now a number of huge opportunities for you to create your YouTube channels the opportunities when you can create your own YouTube channels, when you can manage your social networks, your websites, and through this tell about our project, talk about airships, and at the same time, the interest in airships. And this topic in Russia and other countries is very high. And now, if you are the first, those who will create these resources, it is indeed precisely thanks to your resources that potential investors and people interested in this will learn about the project. So hurry up while you definitely have this opportunity. If we talk about our results, let's start with that. The project has been funded for about three weeks, not even a month yet, and the results are actually indeed excellent. Currently, we already have more than a thousand investors, specifically 1,150 people have voted with their money that they like this as mentioned, we are getting started and most of the general information about what we are doing are in these webinars. Almost $4 million worth of commitments have already been sold, so to speak. Indeed, these are not the funds that have already entered the company's accounts, but rather the funds that will be deposited into the company's accounts over the next few years. Because you can invest with us in installments, 
paying a small amount each month for your investment package. If we talk about the actual funds received, the exchange rate of the dollar is constantly changing, and it amounts to about 30 million rubles. This is an excellent result. This allows us, already at the beginning of September, well, for now, we are orienting ourselves around these dates to transfer the first funds directly for the implementation of the project, excluding referral rewards, which have already amounted to almost $30,000, by the way, paid out, not counting the marketing expenses that were incurred. This indeed indicates that I hope starting from September, we will definitely be able to monitor the implementation of the projects and perhaps we will soon have an office and the first employees will be hired. In general, Fyodor will tell you more about this shortly, but this is already a new stage, a new step where we can take a look inside the company being created, which will be focused on airships. At the same time, many were worried about whether we could manage two projects simultaneously and if we would have enough strength and resources for that. And now we can definitely say that yes, we are succeeding. Not without some difficulties, because at Solar Group, some people are currently working at maximum capacity or even a little more. Indeed, there is now an additional workload. Gradually, the staff will be expanded and new specialists will be hired. I hope we can resolve this issue quickly. At the same time, Looking at the results of the Duyunov engine project, we can already see that the financial plan has been fulfilled on the contrary. More than 60 million rubles will be transferred to the Duyunov engine project in total for August. So, friends, yes, we can finance two projects, and it is already clear that we are doing this successfully. At the last webinar, I mentioned that on one hand, our funding seems indeed similar, but on the other hand, it will indeed differ significantly in some aspects. In particular, we have a functionality, such as increasing packages, for example, in the engine project to another. Here we mentioned that such an opportunity will not be available. Similarly, there will be no possibility to restore your installment payments if you have experienced a cancellation. In other words, if you were paying in installments and then stopped, it will not be possible to restore them. I know many investors have now taken small investments in the new project, hoping they will be able to increase them in the future, as they did in the Duyunov engine project. Therefore, very soon there will indeed be a technical possibility for us to open the option to increase investment packages during the pre-launch phase. However, once the pre-launch stage is over, you will no longer be able to increase your investment packages. So, if the project truly resonates with you, if you are interested in this topic and definitely see the potential in it, just as we do, then now you certainly have the opportunity to take the maximum package under the current conditions, knowing that it will be impossible to go back and receive these conditions again. I would like to remind you that currently, at the pre-launch stage, the investment conditions are twice as good as they will be at the first stage of financing. Right now, the discount is an average of 1,000, but it will be 500. So keep that in mind. In the chats, I see that people are already asking when the opportunity to increase their current starter package will appear. Look, it will technically appear soon, but overall you might not want to expect it. If you are interested in increasing the investment package, please contact technical support. They collect requests and process manually. So don't wait for this. Write to support immediately and inform your investors and partners about it as well so they can do the same right away because the pre-launch phase will be quite short and we won't extend it later so take advantage of the opportunities you have of course in order to believe in what is happening to believe in this company to believe in this project one wants to receive more information and to understand how it is developing and this is exactly why we are holding such a webinar today, which has already become a weekly event. So now I will pass the floor to Fyodor Konstantinov. Fyodor, please tell us what work is currently being done at the company. So friends, don't forget to write your questions. We will answer them at the end. So Pavel, the first question for you. 
Indeed, all the preparatory work was definitely done on time. And as you said, the first money will be transferred soon. We are sitting here waiting for the first funds. Everything is ready in the office. The employment contracts are all prepared. The equipment is already being selected and there are agreements regarding the land. So as soon as the first funds are deposited into the account, everything starts to move actively and develop very dynamically, making a transition to the next stage, which is indeed, truly, the stage of receiving funds. We are ready and waiting, but in reality, we are not just waiting. We are moving forward, holding meetings. By the way, I recently slightly digressed from the topic, but it's still all related. We met with Dennis and got acquainted with a very cool guy. When I met him, I realized that he is like a young, underrated Elon Musk, our very own Russian version. They engage in launching stratospheric devices, both large and small, and he makes his own satellites, including microsatellites. There's this format called CubeSats, and he creates these small devices. The most interesting thing is that he already has several of his own in orbit, more than a dozen actually, and monitors track them. They send radio signals. Telemetry comes from them too. In general, he's an incredibly cool guy. We got acquainted better, shared our direction we're moving towards. He said, guys, I'm really glad you appeared. Let's collaborate together. He immediately came up with plans on how we could act together. So during our first meeting itself, we made significant progress, meaning our visions aligned perfectly well, which is wonderful news indeed. Soon enough, we will introduce you all to him, and he'll come here, and we'll sit down for chat. This week, I was honestly shocked didn't know one could turn off the Leningrad Highway in Moscow and arrive at some industrial zone where someone has monitors hanging on roof antennas, telemetry reception, and satellites flying high, working alongside European Space Agency. He'll tell about himself now. Let us return back to where we're heading and how exactly we're moving ahead. Uh. We're obviously moving towards airships. Today we've Boris Alexandrovich Evchenko in studio. We've had preliminary conversation already, and he's briefly explained what certification involves. So let's not talk about certification yet, but generally, Boris Alexandrovich, how did you come into aeronautics? When did it all start? Can you tell such a story about yourself correctly? I can. Good evening. What can I say? As usual, by chance, absolutely by chance, I ended up in ballooning and, in particular, in airship construction. I was currently finishing my postgraduate studies at the prestigious and renowned Bowman Moscow State Technical University at the department, the Royal Chair. These are indeed launch vehicles, and I was, in fact, actually involved in the dynamics of the structure. My dissertation was related to that. It was about spacecraft, about the space station. In other words, I had no relation to airships or ballooning, but we have a department that was not only actively engaged and involved in the development of rocket engines, it also focused on both dynamics and strength of structures. All space technology consists entirely of thin-walled structures. That is, the dynamics and strength of thin-walled structures, and in particular, soft structures, airfield balloon type ones, and we had a very serious group of professors. Among them were the authors of the theory of soft shells. At that time, the only enterprise in the USSR was specifically the Dolgoprudny Design Bureau of Automation, which was engaged in aeronautics. It was. In 1982, there was a change. 
a new director came in, maybe in 1981, 1982. Dementiev Piotr Petrovich, young, energetic, son of the Minister of Aviation Industry of the USSR. And he was also assigned to it just at the time when there was also a wave of development in airship construction. There were several public airship design bureaus in the country. The DKB was tasked with creating and reviving the airship. A certain reorganization was carried out at the enterprise. Highly specialized specialists were needed in certain specific fields of science. And to my department, where I completed my postgraduate studies, came the head of the department, Sergei Pavlovich Chernikov, and asked if there were indeed actually, in fact, any people who could be invited to work. And they pointed me out to him. I met him again, and he invited me. And I immediately went from an engineering position to the head of the aerodynamics and dynamics sector, aerial buoyancy techniques, and the load. This was my area of expertise. Naturally, I came to the company at first without understanding anything about it. I sat in the library all the time. I read and learned. Well, I was young and full of energy. How old was I back then? I was 25, 26 years old, and that's how I ended up in December 1982. It stayed that way. Along with me, another comrade came. He is probably well known to many in the field. Shigarev Sergei Nikolaevich. Then we worked together, and since those times, I have been engaged in this as well. He is too. That's how I ultimately ended up in airship construction. You just said something very interesting. This is the first time I'm hearing it seriously. Are these some kind of public organizations dealing with airship what? Airship construction. But that was in the Soviet Union. And how did it work? Were there any initiative groups? Yes. Initiative groups. They could have been at the Palace of Youth, or at some enterprises. In other words, they supported young scientists, and they gathered and developed. There were not only young people, there were such groups in Moscow. At the Moscow Militia Institute, usually it was associated with someone. It was in St. Petersburg, in Sverdlovsk, in Siberia, it was in Kiev. The Antonov Company, it was in Lviv, well, I mean, there were quite a few of them. They proposed their various projects, wrote to different government institutions, and offered their additional projects. That is to say, people did not receive any money for this. Moreover, there were aviation and space specialists involved. In general, it was quite competent. It's actually a really cool story, because it turns out that a very large number of people have indeed been proactively working to develop airships, proposing their projects, and they were everywhere, in various places. You mentioned Moscow, Kiev, and so forth. Well, there were probably about 10 centers across the Soviet Union. But in the end, he led the entire DKB. But it did not take the lead. It was the only state enterprise that dealt with this within the framework of the Ministry of Aviation Industry. And it was tasked specifically with airship construction because it has been involved in ballooning for many years for a long time that is the history of dkb is like this well in the 1930s there was the air Noble, and the airship construction of the ussr was created which later disbanded after the rise of airship partially from it the airship training complex has transformed into the current fistec somehow there somehow there somehow there there somehow there there somehow there somehow there somehow there the factory is dmz the dolgoprodny machine engineering plant partially transferred to tsagi tsagi is the central aerohydrodynamic institute the leading institute for aerodynamics dynamics and strength of aviation technology in the USSR and now in Russia. So it just fell apart into these various parts. And then airship construction continued only within the specific framework of TSAGI. Even this was more like some detailed scientific research and experimental studies rather than practical construction efforts. 
In the early 1950s, Americans began launching high-altitude probe balloons over the territory of the Soviet Union and the surrounding areas. Is this not Google? No. This is something completely different. This is earlier. They launched huge balloons there in the sky in the 1950s. Huge. Hundreds of thousands of cubic meters, and they flew at an altitude of 30, 35 kilometers, very high. They were successfully launched to Finland, went to Turkey, and photographed the entire territory. At that time, there were no satellites as such, and at that altitude, aviation could not shoot them down. And so indeed, in contrast to this, Dolgoprudnaya, automation was in fact established to engage in similar activities. Then they brought them balloons, an airship, so this is a kind of revival. It's still hard for me to visualize those thousands of cubic meters in my head. So what size was the sphere after all? Can you tell me again how many cubic meters is that? Does it at least have a diameter? Now let's recalculate. Well, look. So a thousand cubic meters, thousand, how much does that come to? Ten by ten by ten cubic. Yes. If we have 100,000, it turns out to be 100 by 100 by 10. Something elongated like that. 100 by 100 and by 10. That is, it's probably about 60, 70 meters in diameter. 80. I need to calculate. Even more. The prototype of the first satellites existed. Such balloons were sent to the stratosphere for remote sensing and reconnaissance. Well, yes. There were certainly some scientific experiments conducted, but over our territory of the Soviet Union, it was pure reconnaissance. That is, yes, of course, they flew wherever they wanted. That is, they did not have engines. They were not airships. They were launched. The only thing is that the meteorological service at that time was not very good, unlike now. So they roughly knew the direction of the wind, including its speed and consistency. They launched, and somewhere around the area where NATO is, in the general vicinity, they managed to gather them, carefully monitoring the condition. And they processed it because they definitely needed to get the film. There was no such thing as digital television back then. Analog signal transmission existed, but the equipment was so large that anything transmitted from that balloon would have to be 100 times bigger. It was extremely difficult to determine and very difficult to shoot down. I understand. DKB was created against them. DKB has evolved. Similarly, satellites have already started to displace these balloons. This has become less relevant now. Almost no one uses it anymore. It is not used solely for scientific purposes because everything can already be captured by satellite. Well, not everything, as it turned out. Creating a satellite is expensive. Well, yes, dear, but it can be filmed in any case. In any case, the areas that are of interest, yes, of course. Perhaps in the near future, stratospheric airships might potentially slightly encroach on the satellite market, but there it is indeed necessary to solve serious scientific tasks. For now, tell the story, and then we will move on to the certifications. They talk about the first flights with Alexander Nikolaevich. It's a very interesting story. Well, yes, there were such moments, you know. Well, here I, you know. After I worked at DKB, we had a very interesting moment there at the bank. Indeed. At the sunset of the Soviet Union, in 1990, there was, well, also on the wave of another interest in airships. An enterprise was established. Dirigible Construction USSR had such a name. It had a long name. State Scientific Production. State Cooperative. In other words, it was the second enterprise. You are young. You probably don't know. There was a well-known enterprise called Istok, where the director, its owner, brought a party of demolition. They earned something like five or six million. 
That was a huge amount of money. What was it exactly like at the border of the 1990s? What was really interesting about it, at that time many cooperatives emerged. However, the cooperatives could not purchase at state prices. They had other, well, they were actually supposed to have other prices, and they could enter the market with free money. But the state cooperative enterprise had a round seal, a firm one, just like ours. On one hand, we could purchase at state prices and sell at cooperative prices. Many individuals approached us with this desire. Well, we decided it was absolutely a love for dirigible construction and definitely not for making money. So we kind of continued to engage in it regardless. We created several small and intricate devices there and then thermal balloons, which were well, all that infrastructure collapsed, the Soviet Union fell apart, and then there was no time for, in general, no time for air transport. So tell us about these two devices. You mentioned that two devices were created. This is with Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin. In 1993, I started working with him, initially as the head of the design department, then as the deputy general. Designer, deputy chief designer. He was the deputy chief designer and director at the enterprise headquarters. Two devices were created, Aerostatics 01 and Aerostatics 02. These are essentially the first flying, properly flying vehicles of the post-war period. Since the post-war period in the Soviet Union and in Russia as well, that is, they had already been created in Russia, in the Russian Federation. These are single-seat devices. There were small devices. It was first lifted into the air in 1994. This is Rastatika 01. Its volume was small at 370 cubic meters. The entire apparatus weighed just 400 kilograms. 400 kilograms. The shell and the pilot, one person. Everything together. It was a very small device. It had a very small compact engine approximately 28 horsepower. RMZ, well, it's domestic. It flew for approximately two hours. Its flight speed was around 75 to 80 kilometers per hour. A small device, and in the following year, in the subsequent year, this device was created. The person created it in total less than 10, approximately, you know, but we both designed it and actually partially manufactured it. Of course, there were significantly more subcontractors involved. In fact, but they also assembled it by themselves. The first device was at the Kubinka airfield, which is indeed actually located near Moscow. And there was a very, very interesting moment with him. They assembled him for the very first time and brought him out of the hangar. The hangar was quite large. They brought it out of the hangar into the field and placed it on the mooring mast. They haven't flown yet. They just brought them out and placed them on the mooring mast to take a look. But the mooring mast was there and everything was concreted over. So it was impossible to screw into the field. Well, probably about 300 meters from the gate. Then, well, we stood there for a while. It was fine. And we decided that it was enough. We needed to head back, you know, the first times are always very scary. It's not scary in that way, but it's scary for the apparatus. Because, well, it's unclear how. How will it behave? What will it lead to? What a wind it is, because it seems like the wind is three to five meters per second. But you feel like there's a hurricane, that it will knock you off your feet, sweep you away. That's the feeling. And then you look, and it's actually nothing at all. If you didn't hold on to the ropes, you would. But as it is, you didn't actually feel anything. It's really scary. So we actually ended up in a situation where we looked. And indeed, there was a military airfield in the hangar. And the warrant officer replied, We look, and the gates are closing. We say, Well, are we coming? Bring them in but the gate is closed. 
And what are we going to do? Just stand here with him. We say, Alexander Nikolaevich, go and open it, but be careful. We know there's a shepherd dog running around there. And when he closes the gate, he lets her out. Well, San Nikolaevich went there, not through the gate, but through the entrance. He opened the door, and there really was a shepherd dog waiting for him. He fell out, and he was trying to fend her off. He couldn't close the door. It fell into the anteroom along with him. In general, he broke his arm, fell there, but managed to fend her off. The gates opened, and we started the apparatus. And then, that was the first story. That is, and there was also the story with the second device. A year later, we created the second device. But did the first one fly? Yes, of course, he definitely flew. Moreover, we also had two pilots with him there. Initially, it was Stanislav Lebedev and then Selivanov. Selivanov was Vitali Petrovich. Later, he became a distinguished test pilot. He was very serious. A person. There was, in fact, a pilot. And why would he actually be here? Moreover, we were very interesting in the 1990s by various parameters. In particular, there were no special ones. No one knew what was allowed and what was not. These flights in Kubinka would not be permitted now, but no one would have allowed them. Because this is experimental aviation, there must be special permission, special access, and so on and so forth. The numbers indicate that the airfield should be a test site, and it was in general an airfield of a military unit. But the generals allowed us. They said it was fine. Well, I mean, those were the times back then. In the law, both in a good way and in a bad way. Here, in a good way. And so, when we were already preparing to fly, the commander of the Aviation Corps and his deputy came to see and give permission for the airship. And then Selivanov just sat down. I think he trained them to fly on attack aircraft back in the day. He is actually a test pilot, and he indeed started out as an instructor. They knew him. He was 50 years old at that time. They knew him. And, oh, he was very... This airship, although it was small, had both the first and the second. It had a vector thrust adjustment. That is, it took off vertically from the ground, from the ground, and it could hover and he rose up by one meter, then by two. They are standing away from him. He is 1.5 meters away. He rose up, waved his hand through the glass, and accelerated. And so, he went at about 30 degrees. He made a circle and landed. They looked and said, you can fly. You really can. That was with the very first one. This results in the first instance of such maneuverability allowing it to hover in place and ascend at a 30-degree angle. Well, there, but it definitely wasn't the very first flight. We had made several flights. We were allowed to... It wasn't exactly the first flight. There were some shortcomings as well. In the very first flight, we had a failure with the altitude controls. When Lebedev Stanislav wanted to go up, he actually wanted to go down. But he went up instead. In general, he turned off the engine, dropped the ballast, and landed. The airship is practically safe because it transitions into free flight. It is balanced, and overall, there are no problems here. There were also problems with Yelevanov, but they were addressed along the way. Any flying vehicle needs to be taught how to fly. Well, it's clear. And here is the first actually successful one. Obviously, there are minimal shortcomings, but still. They have always existed, but in fact, in general, just literally a week or two later, they actually made such a demonstrative and impressive flight. How much time did it take? From the moment you decided to build it until the first flight? Well, it's actually practically just a little over a year. In over a year, the device will be ready? Good pace. And a year later, Rostatica 02 appeared in the market, in the industry. Tell me about him. Was he bigger? It was larger. Its volume was almost twice as much, 650 cubic meters. Although it was also a single-seater, 
In other words, it was not actually a step forward. I was still arguing with Alexander Nikolaevich. I said we should build a two-seater device so that it would be a two-seater right away. But simply put, Aerostatic 01 was an incredibly very lightweight device and efficient. Its fabric strength was insufficient and the engine was not powerful enough. In other words, it was like a first attempt right. Very light apparatus. The Aerostatica 02 has a volume of 650 cubic meters. Its length is 27.5 meters. That is, it was a device that could fly firstly for four hours. Its speed was just over 90 kilometers per hour. We measured it at about 95, 96, so it was already higher. It could lift 120 kilograms along with the pilot. That is, this is already... If there we chose someone to be thinner among the pilots on the first aircraft and could hardly manage anything. And with a small amount of fuel, yes, a small quantity, this device could already allow a person, well, in general, not, of course, better with less. But a person weighing 100 kilograms could fly. It also had a more powerful engine, the Austrian Rotax, with 64 horsepower. And it already had a fuel capacity of 60 liters, indeed. That is, the device was already there. But it was more serious. And in general, it could be used. We flew a lot with it, like advertising. At that time, flying over Moscow was allowed. It was stationed in Tushino. It took off from Tushino and flew to VDNH. Flying was allowed back in the air along the Moscow River. Flying was also permitted along the main highways. So if yes, were there permissions granted just by a handshake or were there already some papers, bureaucracy involved? No, there was naturally bureaucracy and paperwork, but everything was much simpler. Now the FSO will not allow flying. Over Moscow, yes. Is it because the situation is generally complicated? No, you know, I believe they were actually already there before. You see, there were some troublemakers back then. I would say, idiots. There was a moment in the past when hot air balloons were allowed to fly almost from Red Square in Moscow, where there were flights, and they took off and landed in various places. The wind was chosen this way, but the wind could do it. At one point, the wind was almost directly above the Kremlin. Someone there decided to descend very low. It's beautiful to look at, but they were warned about it. It's not allowed. After that, such flights were banned. Well, that is, everything should have a certain measure. Well, of course, but it smells of industrial freedom. Hmm. They allowed flying over Red Square. Well, yes. Back then a lot was possible. And here is the airship, Aerostatic 02. I mean, we flew with advertising. And in fact, that's how we made money. Because new devices were not being ordered. Movies were being filmed. Chinese service. They flew to Nizhny Novgorod. It was also an interesting saga when we had some sort of accompaniment. It was necessary to be in Nizhny Novgorod. There at Strelka, this film was shot where the dirigible airship was featured. In fact, they made a second seat outside the cabin. And there they kind of carried a second person, although the device is single-seater. Well, a stuntman, yes, but... The first to fly was Alexander Nikolaevich at this place. His status instructor pilot, Vasily Ivanovich, told him, it's your design, go ahead and land. If you fly, others will sail below. The classic approach for designers, right? When the bridge designer has built the bridge, they tell him, your house will stand under the bridge, so go live there. Well, at least the first day standing there when the diesel locomotive or the steam locomotive with loaded cars passes by with the whole family, right? Standing under the bridge. It was kind of like that. Responsibility of the chief designers? Yes, absolutely. The history, indeed, in general, has been tumultuous for you. Yes, it was indeed interesting. And so, moving on to today's realities and a bright future, I understand that even experimentally, 
to lift the apparatus into the air, certain permissions are still needed. The site must be prepared for this, as well as the apparatus and all the bureaucracy. Can you start talking about this aspect? Can you start talking? Yes, I can. Actually, in this project, my area of responsibility is the certification of the devices being created. But here you see it's like you know where to start. But in general, the device, once it is built, must be officially certified, you know. Any aircraft above a mass of 115 kilograms. In our country, and indeed in almost all countries of the world, the situation is similar. This is, and if there are several paths, but we are talking about civilian devices, of course, about military ones, or in the state ministries of internal affairs, and so on, they have a somewhat different specificity. There, state tests are conducted, and then they are given the same thing. I understand it's simpler there. You conduct military, well, military technical experiments. No, not military technical experiments. State tests are being conducted. State trials. Commission. Question. Generally speaking, in general, they often write that the aircraft or airplane must meet airworthiness standards. It could be something simpler. I was certified. Here I am after, working in aerostatics with Alexander Nikolaevich. Yes, we missed a large part of the history overall. I came to work at the highly esteemed Augur Aeronautical Center in the month of January 2000. At that time, it was a leading enterprise that dealt with private aeronautical technology within the framework of the Augur Aeronautical Center where more than a dozen imported balloon complexes of various volumes were created, including one with a capacity of 12,000 cubic meters. This is for China. We supplied them with small, large, and three airships in total of various sizes, including three types of airships, single-seat, two-seat, and one could say 10-seat, AU-11, AU-12, and its modification AU-12M and its modification, and AU-12 as well, and AU-30. You reiterated the aerostatics principles, then you started to cost more and more. Yes, the AU-11 was essentially a repetition of aerostatics. It had a similar volume of 650 cubic meters and was single-seated, but it was slightly different in some aspect. If in aerostatics a gondola was already used from an airplane, aviation was such a major aircraft. It was slightly refined in terms of design and functionality, and we had our own unique and innovative gondola design, where the pilot sat comfortably and securely. Well, the design of the device is somewhat different for Alexander Nikolaevich. If you look at all the diagrams, you will see that he has an eight-part wing. This is such a distinctive feature of his device. A business card. Yes, his business card. We had a classic X-shaped scheme. X-shaped, not a plus, but an X-shaped scheme, and there were four. That is, there was a difference. The shape of the hull was different. But who was already designing it? After all, there was still... Naturally, Alexander Nikolaevich was in charge of the Rostatic, but the first AU... Well, I was actually the chief designer of the AU-12. I was always... I left the Aviation Center for the Jewar in 2000, and he ultimately, eventually, and finally became the head of the Design Bureau. We had a chief designer. He was the director of the enterprise, Stanislav Vladimirovich Fedorov. However, he did not interfere much with the technical aspects. It allowed us to decide for ourselves. That is, the shape of the hull, the shape of the tail, the tail configuration. The choice was essentially up to us, in fact up to me, but in aerostatics, i.e. in AU-11, it's not entirely about me, but partially. The AU-12 was already somewhat based on my devices. We had a separate chief designer for the AU-30 there, Vadim Zubkevich. 
Yes, we recently went to Kirzak with him, talked, and he told us everything and showed us around. He worked in the design bureau that I headed? Well, yes, indeed. But he was the chief designer of this device, AU-30. Can you tell me a bit about the first AUs, the 11s? How successful were they? Or did you just use them as step one, step two? What did you focus on then? Well, you know, the AU-11 was more like a step, as you say, the first step. They sold it somewhere in Crimea to Ukraine back when it was still that, which was a long time ago. And then they somehow got rid of it in China, which is quite mysterious. To be honest, I don't really know where it disappeared to. Most likely not at this moment. In fact, it was in the year 2001. Then we already... Did you make money on it? Did you just sell it? We worked it out and sold it, yes. We were already creating the AU-12, or rather it was even a bit more interesting. There was the AU-12, and we received an order from France, the French. They ordered the body of the apparatus, that is the shell, the tail, which is above the gondola, and the control system. They designed the gondola themselves. There was a fan of aviation and dirigible construction. His father had money. And he financed this work for him, and they thought they would earn money from it in the end. They probably did, ultimately. Although the design was, to be honest, poor, the customer is always right. That is, the gondola was hanging on cables. Moreover, it was probably about five to six meters longer. So, was it a design decision? Yes, yes. It was specifically wanted from a design perspective. Yes. Well, the design and construction, that is, in addition to the propeller in the gondola, they also had a propeller that generated lift. So it was a two-seater aircraft. The task was such that in France, at least at that time, there was a rule, if I am not mistaken, that the volume of the apparatus should not exceed 1,000 cubic meters. Who exactly should... Why is that really, actually? There is no need for certification there. That is in order not to certify. Do not certify. It is not worth spending money on that. There are, in my opinion, 900 cubic meters of lifting gas, helium. And there's no need for certification, but more is needed now. That is, it was necessary to lift their gondola with such a device. We created it, we went to France. It was interesting too. They helped them gather it. They gathered in the city. They organized a large and important conference event there. They invited them like DSAF had them. Well, indeed, in fact, their marshal... A marshal was speaking there already in retirement. There is no aviation. In general, everything was kind of as they had it. And we carefully assembled it in a hangar near Paris, which was built by Eiffel. In the 1930s, it seems that an airship filled with hydrogen took off somewhere. In the city, the central part was restored and beautifully covered with glass, but there were no gates with intricate designs and artistic patterns. That is, it was only assembled there, then it was taken somewhere to the airfield and transported from there. So the assembly took place there. And the wings are usually, typically, generally at the Ellings. The Elling itself, can you imagine, is actually a large building. This is a relatively fairly enclosed space on all sides. There should be gates at the ends and through which large openings also allow steam to escape. It wasn't there. Everything was sealed up. And a, a, a. on the left and right, there are usually wings of sorts, either single story or two story extensions, where the designers are located. They had a workshop there, as it was written, in fact. They were still creating shift shells there since those times so that it could be taken nearby and brought out to the large hangar. There, all the floors were rotten. One could have gotten seriously injured in those extensions. They restored the central part, well, conditionally made it. 
And you went there to help them build an airship? Yes, together with them. They rented well. It was actually quite interesting, you know? Cool. So it turns out Eiffel built it and they operated it. Well, they operated it. Then, unfortunately, apparently, a tragedy indeed occurred. They froze it, and at some point, and this is indeed under Paris La Fontaine, a truly beautiful suburb. Yes, a suburb. There is a park for Air Force veterans, a park, a lake. And so, on the territory of this park, it stood in this hangar. It was not used. That is, they handed it over to those French airship builders, in my opinion, like that. Well, like in the Air Force, you know, veterans, right, and all. The Air Force reached out with a request saying, please help us. Yes, for God's sake, go ahead. How did you do it? So you produced the main components in Russia and went there to assemble it? Yes, they sent it under the contract. They arrived there to assemble. Did they gather and drive it all together, perhaps? No, they didn't rush. We gathered. They held a conference, took some photos. There was nowhere to take it out. There was nowhere to go. There is no gate. Can you imagine? This product is 1,000 cubic meters. It's about 30 meters long. In diameter, it is approximately, approximately 37 something meters. It comes out to 7 something meters. The extension is approximately about 4 in total. It also needs to be transported. And furthermore, where exactly should it be taken? Nowhere. So they filled it with gas, but not too much. Just enough for it to stand well. Helium was still cheaper back then than it is now, but it still had a cost. We took photos, tried it on, and accepted our work. We delivered the envelope, connected it to the gondola, and everything is working fine. And that's it. We left released the gas, left, and then they were already filling it with gas. After some time, the guys came to us and repaired the envelope. They were already flying somewhere in the south of France with advertisements. After all, were they flying? No, they flew for several years, even five or six years. They were used for advertising. It would be interesting to see the photo. If anyone can Google it now and share it in the group chat, find that suspended gondola on cables, I would also be interested to take a look. And this was also an intermediate stage. Next, you developed a more serious apparatus. Well, it turned out that we received an order from the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Moscow. This is a device for flights over Moscow. Well, some events in particular, when we created it, it almost came down. Madonna performed in Moscow at Luzhniki in the stadium. And there he arrived. Usually, flying to Moscow was no longer permitted. They said even the Ministry of Internal Affairs would shoot them. So the most they did was fly around the MCAD, monitoring the situation on the roads in the Moscow region. It was also a small device. Yes, it was a two-seater device, the same one, but it had a single envelope, which we called AU-12M. If one had 1,000 cubic meters, this one had 1,200, just a little bit more. It didn't pass, so we increased the envelope and made the apparatus like this. We conducted certification for this apparatus. We received a type certificate for it. A type certificate allows you to do this, it is issued by Russian aviation authorities for any aircraft. If you obtain a type certificate in Europe, America, or anywhere in the world, you have the right to duplicate it and repeat it as many times as you want. So was this the first airship with a type certificate? Yes. In modern Russia in the present day? The only one. The first and only one. And in general, there are not many such aircraft after modern Russia, especially aviation ones, that have received type certificates. We don't have many civil airplanes. Yes, very interesting indeed. So you were actually in charge of the design bureau that created it. You were involved in its certification as well. Yes, indeed. Very cool. 
If anyone remembers those airships that flew over the MCAD from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, put a plus sign, and we'll count how many are here. Well, you see, there isn't that much of it. But was it operated? They were operated. Well, also, in general, the operation was limited because they were not really allowed to fly within Moscow, so they had only a few flights. There, when Lushkov came, he was accompanied. Also, I mentioned Madonna, but mostly they flew along the Kada. They were based in Zhukovsky, located at the airfield of the Miasishchev Company in the city of Zhukovsky. What is the correct name of the Messerschmitt Aviation Enterprise? They had a hangar there. The apparatus was based in this hangar, two apparatuses, one in one hangar, the second in another. But they usually mostly flew on one aircraft. He primarily flew on Max. At the maximums, well, it was like this, and even Max's safety was ensured. There at night, well, early in the morning, in the evening, I flew. And what about the instruments? Or did people just look with their own eyes, perhaps? The pilot is currently visual. He was transporting an individual. Our pilot. It is a two-seater. Someone will film there. From the security officer, I understood. And it also worked in our devices. They made two pieces and sold them. But we made three of them. We did. Well, yes, we earned it. We made two for the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And we delivered the third unit to Thailand. We had an order for Thailand. In general, it was delivered to Thailand. And what were they for? They flew with advertisements. Advertising? Yes. They put up advertisements and flew filming in various... Actually, they told us a little about it in Kurzach, that they used it to display advertisements. They have a local king there, and they said something to him, some words of gratitude. Yes, it's actually beautiful, by the way, and it was covered in advertisements. There are photos online that you can find. We look beautiful and nice. Moreover, there are some very well-known brands. Brands, brands. They were advertised on it. Like Toyota, Google. I don't know. I don't remember anymore. Someone very unknown. It turns out that it was used as an advertisement. Someone was also making money from it. First of all, we made money by selling to them. After that, they started earning interesting. How much did it pay off for them exactly in the end? I really don't know. It's quite hard for me to say. Probably, it really paid off. And then we finally made the AU-30. This is already by the assignment of the CIP. This is the Center for Infrastructure Projects. Actually, Aeroscan was their enterprise that built the Kursach base. And... They were supplied with two airships there. AU-30. They did not receive a type certificate. They received a certificate for a single sample. This is also possible. But it is renewed every year. It's simpler if it is in operation. Yes, it can be operated, but it cannot be copied. It cannot be produced in series. No, you can copy. There are nuances. If there are more than five of them, I definitely don't remember then you can't. Up to five units can be certified as a single sample. It's just that if you received a type certificate, that and its somewhat simplified version, it is manufactured at the enterprise slightly. There is acceptance. Well, usually in our country, it is military acceptance, but it was like it was back then. This acceptance was probably carried out by the MAK, International Aviation Committee. We had an International Aviation Committee. This is actually the one that issued this certificate. Like, well, now it's Rosaviation. And so, there are representatives from the federal agency Rosaviation who diligently and meticulously sign and officially produce a detailed document for each and every manufactured aviation device. This is the certificate. And then, he receives the tail numbers and so on. If it is a single sample certificate, then you receive it for one year for a specific aircraft. The next one also needs to be certified. The next one as well. Of course, it's easier if the same certifiers are involved. If they see that the aircraft is indeed the identical one, then this is a standard situation. Moreover, a year has passed and you must confirm it. 
At the very least, some test flights should be conducted. They need to check if the service life has expired and perform some control. Test flights. That means you have to do it every single year. Moreover, I strongly believe you can't sell tickets for it at all. With the official certificate, you can do absolutely whatever you want. And this is not all the aviation work that can be performed. You can use it for research purposes or for something else, already commercial. He's involved in the transportation of people. And even for cargo, yes. In general, you need to obtain a type certificate. Can you sell, for example, a pen to someone and as a gift offer an unforgettable trip on a non-certified airship? And then, if something happens to a person, you will embark on another unforgettable journey. Right. If nothing happens and no one, then it's possible. But if, God forbid, something does happen, then specially trained people will come. Of course. But if something happens even on a certified one, I understand, it doesn't matter anyway. No. Everything is different there now. Tell me, it's very interesting. Well, I understand that the airship is the safest type of aviation transport. There can be an airship, a helicopter, and an airplane. It happens. A commission is established to determine who is at fault based on the results. Interestingly, it is often the pilots who are found to be at fault. However, this could be simpler for everyone. Well, you see, if... It's very somewhat sad to hear this from the pilot's perspective. You crashed, and then they said it retroactively. Well, on the other hand, there have indeed been instances or occurrences in the history of the Soviet Union when they acknowledged that something, it flew away. And I think they also filmed it on a Boeing. They are figuring it out. But that was a whole... They are figuring it out. But then it becomes a whole saga. That's when certification, the accounting of all losses on the part of the company, and so on and so forth, come into play. In other words, why, how, what was overlooked. In this case, everyone is to blame. On one hand, the developers are at fault, and on the other hand, the certifiers, who are not private companies but state entities, are also to blame for allowing it because certification. You see, involves two concepts. You have a device, for example, a technical specification. The client says, here is a pen for me. It should write, be red in color, write underwater, and so on and so forth, right? But that's all well and good. But the certification of the device or the same handle does not address this. It may, the device won't take off, but it also won't take off. The safest device that is on the ground it does not fly, therefore it is important for them during certification. This is safety, the most important thing. That is, they are not responsible for speed, for execution. How many passengers are transported? What is the speed of the aircraft? What is its flight altitude? Important flight technical characteristics? Here. Safety is of utmost importance. For example, you might accidentally poke your eyes out with this pen or someone else's. It won't explode under pressure, so you can write underwater. There are also other moments like that. Therefore, if, for example, something happens with the aircraft, it is thoroughly investigated, which means that something was overlooked, but such moments have occurred. For example, right now in aviation, and we also use lithium-ion batteries, don't we? For a while they were not allowed in aviation, because, but now they are permitted. Now, there is a hole. In general, they undergo certification themselves, specifically for the components. It is quite complicated. That is, if you take a battery that is not certified according to aviation standards, you can take it and certify it as part of the apparatus. This is possible, but it will be very expensive. It is expensive in terms of proving that it is safe, that it needs to be 
heated, frozen, thrown, and other such requirements. If you take individual components that have passed the standards, they will cost about five times more than regular ones. But you shouldn't spend money on additional components that are highly reliable. That is, savings are still present. When you take something certified, it's not about saving money, it's about the economy. However, savings need to be calculated because what is more profitable, for example, take a propeller. There are various different types of components and systems on the aircraft. Let's talk about the different categories. The most important categories are the first ones, the propeller and the engine. Well, and some other things. Emergency safety equipment, type, life vest. This also falls into the highest category, which is quite significant and important, or some other one, depending on various factors and conditions. But then it gets simpler, making it easier to understand and manage. And if it is also allowed, although some may, uh, a transport airship with a large number of people, the engine must be obtained only from certified sources, only by aviation authorities, another, in general, in the composition of devices that can be certified for small aircraft locations. But it's also very complicated. I can tell you, when we certified the AU-12 Pavgur, we clearly knew that we would definitely not achieve a good speed indeed. Why? Because we used the aircraft propellers from aviation, but they have two blades and we needed four. And we just took them and stacked them like that, even though we understood that it could be calculated and manufactured, and it would be much better, especially if we took composites. But these screws were made of wood. And wood does not age. It does not need to be tested for aging. And aging tests require entire stands and expensive screws. So it turns out that it is about the resource. Aging on resources. And it turns out that to avoid this, not always the best things are chosen. But those that easily pass certification. Understood. We need to calculate. What is more advantageous in terms of time can vary, in general, because this applies to any equipment, any... Aviation is particularly sensitive to this. It is complex and has a strong attitude towards it. Well, airships are also included. This is essentially a sum of compromises. The developer is experienced, he may know that for the tail, a specific type should be chosen. For the engine, another type should be selected, and a very good material should be used for the shell, even better if it is made from a composite. Well, when they are taking into consideration what this will cost, it will be either gold or platinum. Yes, in terms of price and also in terms of weight. Then, addressing someone, they say, we won't be able to do that in two years. We need five years, or we will put you in line, and you will receive it in a year. I need it. In two months, I have to choose from what is available. That is, I am saying that any creation of the apparatus is a choice. The sum of compromise. The sum of compromise is yes, and the apparatus is optimal. Well, it doesn't happen. That's a real shame. It would be better if he were at least, let's say, perhaps rational, at least not optimal. Unfortunately, it is so. Life for us. To great, yes, regret. I really want to comment on this situation. It turns out there is the opportunity, there is technology, there are brains, and there are hands to create a super modern, super cool device. But it starts with, this is not certified, it will take a long time to do this, it is completely prohibited. And then it went on with, but, 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 but. You know, it's not, and probably that's right. I can give you an illustration as a case in point, for instance. Basically speaking, the 
New Zeppelin is currently considered to be one of the most advanced airships among those that are flying today. Well, perhaps second only to what is known as English Ethelender airship model, but it is very expensive indeed, as I understand. And that is why, in fact, very few have actually been manufactured, because it turns out to be very economically advantageous. If it were indeed economically viable, they would actually be produced. But it has, in fact, been created for years. Well, I could be mistaken, of course, but it was probably about 20 years ago, maybe 15. That is, during this time, they could have been produced at least two to three per year and developed smoothly. But there aren't that many. They haven't been produced. The maximum is about 10. Well, that's the maximum that has been produced, most likely even less. Due to the fact that the equipment is expensive, its area of application becomes very, very limited. But even so, when we were there, it was clear that the company has money and they are earning from both tourism and the sale of these one-time devices. But they do very little. But everything there is still expensive and luxurious. Even considering that they have fallen into this trap where the cost of the device is enormous and therefore sales are very rare, but... They also have the design, to be honest. Alexander Nikolaevich spoke at his presentation. I don't even understand how to name it. Inside them, no. It, you see, structurally, airships can be soft, semi-rigid, or rigid. You may have heard, by the way, in our project, the first device will actually be soft. That is to say, it is a soft and flexible structure filled with air, inflated, under excess atmospheric pressure, and a gondola is somehow suspended beneath it. A semi-rigid design is when the gondola, there is a keel beam, it distributes the load along its entire length, and the gondola is already practically suspended from the keel beam. And how about there? The keel beam distributes to the shell. This is already a different question. But this is also essentially a soft structure. There is a rigid structure. Here's how it is. Pulsar. Nikolaevich is a 10 ton and above. They have a rigid construction. That is, it is a set of frames. Circular ones. Power elements. Longitudinal stringers. That is, this is the structure. This is how it looks. A frame. Right. And then... Like a basket? Well, a basket. Well, like an airplane. Like someone, right? Like the fuselage of an airplane. He also creates, and the tool for the stringers, the old airships have been seen. It doesn't matter what complex design they have. That's not what I'm talking about. It turns out to be quite rigid. That is, if gas is released, it won't fall. It will just stay there. And what are the Germans saying? Not this... Or that. Who has it? In Germany. The Germans have, you see, a triangular support truss inside that runs along the apparatus and touches in separate sections, you know. Additionally, it, it is definitely fixed along three corners. So this results in a structure. And therefore, the tail section extends from the tail to the nose. And there, the gondola is hanging. So it turns out that firstly, they assemble it very cleverly. That is, it can only be assembled inside the frame under air. And this is a gas volume. So they assemble it under air. Furthermore, it is impossible to pull it out from there. The shell cannot be folded. How can gas be filled into it? They launch, well, there are indeed different types like heavy gas, which is then very slowly released with helium. That is, they initially had an air attack, then they start to supply helium from above. A very slow pace was calculated, which on one hand did not mix, but on the other hand, if it was slow, it still had some speed, and the valves were open. He expels the air, but the frequency is still insufficient. When some mixing certainly occurs anyway, then after that they run this gas through purification facilities and to 
ensure its purity. I understand. They separate one from the other, yes. It's very difficult, long, expensive. Well, the Germans like to complicate things, yes, to create difficulties for themselves. But his device, you see, actually has a very good steering system, you know, in the front part, in the nose, you know, which, in my opinion, I don't know, cost about 20 million euros to develop. They have a very clever and efficient system of propellers at the tail that move left and right. Therefore, they were able to place the engine at the back. This is due to the spine that runs inside the fuselage. The scheme is good, but it is still very expensive and not affordable for many people. That's right. Our task is to make the schemes better, cheaper, and more reliable. I would say it's more rational. More rational. The designs do not need to be optimal. Achieving optimality is very difficult, practically impossible. However, they should be rational and balanced. In terms of price, quality, safety, everything, well said indeed. Absolutely. Let's take a look at what is currently being written about the issues. They say indeed, actually, name airships in Russian. Can you tell me about the 1930s in the meantime? How much was accomplished during that time? I will separate the questions for now. Well, five units were planned. In reality, probably four were actually produced. Two for the Moscow government, which oversees various administrative functions in the city. Two for the CIP. These are the aeroscans that were operated in Kirtsakh, a town known for its aviation history. One was delivered to France, specifically to Etienne, who is an aviation enthusiast. He wanted to fly it to the North Pole, a challenging and ambitious endeavor. They killed him. And what about the unmanned one? A large unmanned vehicle was even planned. What airship? Do you have? The gondola is standing in Kursach. It's like a model. Well, this, this is a separate job entirely. There was something quite similar to that, but it was not exactly the same. It had some differences. But it did not reach completion. Unfortunately, there was not sufficient time. So? That is, they actually had enough equipment for only five aircraft. Probably four of them were operational, in fact. And what happened to the four that flew? Where did they go? Were they also sold? No. Two were made for the Moscow government, but they never really came to fruition. They were in high demand and were carefully stored there for future use. Two of them were actively flying at the time. This event took place in the town of Kirsach, which is known for its aviation history. They were used for different tasks, but that's a separate topic. When we built them, they were specifically planned for RAO and the EU for the purpose of the study of power transmission networks and their overall condition and additional aspects. And there was a specially developed complex that operated in various wavelengths, including the radio spectrum, optics and infrared, among others, such as he was generally and carefully and thoroughly and meticulously inspecting the power lines when an airship flew overhead, identifying breaks and energy leaks, especially if the ground was nearby or if a tree was growing or something else. And I was supposed to map it out in great detail and with precision. The scheme we had, you see, turned out to be such a very complex and intricate plan that, as I was told, there weren't really any proper schemes. All the electrical networks and energy networks were not mapped out in any coherent, comprehensive, and organized manner. That is, only the people who actually provided maintenance for them knew. So, 
if there were any intersections. This also required more precise mapping, in fact. They were involved in this project or activity, which was quite significant and impactful at the time. But I think they didn't do it for long because there was a major reorganization of Rayo UES, which is a major Russian electric power holding company. And in general, this enterprise became not very in demand in the market and lost its prominence. I don't really know for sure. I don't want to spread rumors. And so it was indeed later sold to Lyats. It is precisely Kurjak along with exactly the devices. And then his Air Palace Center, Al Gore, bought it in the year 2021, which was a significant event. When they were with us, he bought it back well. And there they conducted tests. They operated the AU-30. That is, they flew. So the main question still remains, yes, unexpectedly, there are many complications with certification. Are all the pitfalls in certification for new states not taken into account? Is there an understanding of modern laws, documentation, processes, and methodologies? Yes. The point is that, well, I am saying that, in fact, in the Russian Federation, there are indeed standards for airworthiness, let's call them that, criteria for airworthiness for airships, which were actually adopted in 1996. But this is essentially practically identical to the American standards in the field of engineering and design for airship design criterion. This is a normal category when there are no more than nine passenger seats. That is to say, this is, for example, nine unmanned vehicles. What are the PAR standards for airworthiness? Yes, they exist. Well, it doesn't matter. They are available, but they were developed in Germany, in Europe, so to speak. Well, in Germany in particular, and in the Netherlands, and they are accepted as standards. There are two categories further. This is the so-called community category, but this is a local category, which is for up to 19 passenger seats. And over 19, this is a transport category, the so-called transport, the same regulatory requirement, they were developed in Europe. These are not standards. These are prototypes of standards, but they are in general accepted as possible means of use. And the Americans also stated in their Federal Aviation Administration that they can be used. By the way, there is most likely an airship that is currently undergoing flight tests this year, but I just don't know. The big dirigible Brinov, right? Brinov, yes. And so, based on these regulations, they most likely received permission to conduct the tests. Did they hang a smaller gondola there to meet these standards? Well, they suspended the Zeppelin gondola, yes, the one that I think they didn't meet the standards for. It's hard to say why they suspended it. I think they did it simply because it was ready without any fuss. They took the existing Zeppelin, handed them a piece of this work, and for minimal money, they used it because, in a way, it's their prototype, and it doesn't matter to them. All right, it's clear with them, but how are we going to act regarding the Russian part of this legislation? Does it mean we need new regulations? No, not. New. You see, according to the law, the issue is not even about the norms. It is necessary to develop a so-called certification basis for each new aircraft. This is indeed its own set of requirements specifically for this device, with its own particular features. Who should develop it? This is signed off and approved by the Aviation Registry of the Authorities of the Russian Federation. Developers are, of course, being developed. It's clear where they know from. Yes, and they are coordinated with special agreements. However, it can be developed and will be developed 
based on the norms that have already been established by the Germans and Americans, which have been accepted. They initially developed them in the early 2000s, around 2001 or 2002. Then they sent them out to all the leading institutes in the field, even to individual people who wanted to provide their valuable feedback. They collected numerous comments from them and then refined the documents meticulously. So this is generally a very complex and lengthy procedure. For example, our specific device, which is quite advanced, will not use internal combustion engines. We will completely discard the parameters related to that. However, we will definitely add some new and innovative features instead. For example, we will have fuel cells. This means that they will be added from the fuel cells. Well, that is, this is a kind of cumulative thing, and she will need to comply with that in order to fully and completely prove that the device meets all of these requirements and specifications. In fact, there are quite a few of them, indeed. Under a thousand requirements, each requirement has points, subpoints, and more. Like a Matryoshka doll, they are nested there. It's clear, but still, this road seems to be built under the feet of those who are walking. Yes. Moreover, it needs to be built starting from the design of the apparatus, because if it is stated, for example, that the engine needs to be separated from the rest of the gondola by a fireproof partition, and if you use, I don't remember, but for example, an aluminum partition of such thickness, or a steel one of such thickness, thinner, it is clear that this is sufficient. You don't need to prove anything. In the design documentation you say, here is the sheet I have laid out, here it is, this is such and such a sheet, and if that is not the case, for example, if you want to save money in their composite material, they will say there, in three seconds, burn it at 3000 degrees and prove that it is non-flammable and that people won't suffocate, and then it all starts. No, you can absolutely go this route if you have everything necessary. You will go to the appropriate fire institute, conduct tests on their installation, and obtain the documents. Yes, you can hold on to that. You can go that way. Well, then you'll be able to walk. And if you lay all this out, knowing it already during the design phase, then it's easier to prove. That's right. First, we act rationally. And indeed then, when we are, so to speak, powerful big with a solid foundation under our feet, indeed we can go ahead and prove what is right. No, there you can even propose your own standards. For example, there is no such thing. It doesn't happen. As for people, well, when they were invented, they were based on old devices, then on airplanes and helicopters, and then they just sat down and thought about what could happen, right? But if this doesn't happen within five, six, seven years, then we can already say, guys, we don't need it. I'll give one example here. In my time, when I first came to the Design Bureau as a young person during the Soviet Union, I was developing, well, we also had norms there, just like I had at the TSAGI. They say, here is the passenger gondola. Well, we had it there. We were making a passenger airship starting with, well, 8,000 cubic meters. And he says, indeed, a load of 15 G. I say, truly, fear God. An airship doesn't actually experience, it's not a rocket. This is actually not an airplane that lands on this. It doesn't happen. They say, yes, we know it doesn't happen. But if it's not difficult for you to do, it's not critical, but you use aviation seats that are designed for this, something else, something else, then don't touch it. In other words, the norms in aviation are written in blood. They should not be touched. If this becomes an obstacle that the aircraft cannot fly with these, we will consider it. That was the approach. The approach is that people are reasonable, everyone understands perfectly, and if the task is to get devices into the air, everyone will cooperate. It's unlikely anyone will sabotage the process. Well, yes, of course, I think so too, but basically there are standards in place and almost all aspects are taken into account. Yes, especially 
I want to emphasize here that all the devices presented at the demonstration to Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin are all practically of a classical type, and all the standards fit them absolutely completely. This is about hybrid devices, for example, that use heating, compression during flight, and other methods. For them, these standards have not been developed and need to be supplemented. And here certain issues may arise to prepare the tests, conduct them again, 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 because it is not entirely clear. For a classic device that uses aerostatics and lift from the rotor system, or aerodynamics, everything is clear. This is the most easy entry. Yes, yes, uh, to automation. They write, hello everyone, what were the people of the Soviet Union like? Genuine, composed, honest, calm, unlike today. I am listening very attentively to your guest. It is very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. They are asking about accountants. Who will handle all of this? Well, that's not for me. Yes, news. They ask a lot. Here. I actually had questions too. I partially answered myself in my head. But what does it mean that a tree does not age? It is aging, it does not, it withstands cyclic loads. It's slightly, I misspoke. But if it's composite or metal, it is subject to cyclic loads. But with metal, it's clear one, two, three, four, it broke. Not all alloys, yes. The same goes for plastic. It does not withstand cyclic loads well. Wood, on the other hand, does. If it hasn't broken under the first load, it won't break under the thousandth. Wood is a natural composite material in itself. The tree has such a property. Everyone knows this. And that is why tests for strength were conducted. As for the number of cycles. It is definitely clear that if you submerge it in water or something else, it will absolutely rot. But for that, it is varnished with varnish and dried. But wood, wood has this kind of... It turned out to be a mechanical property. Absolutely amazing and completely natural. Take a look over here. These are houses that are beautifully made of sturdy logs. They are even cracked and yet remarkably they stand and hold. In fact, if the log is very large, it tends to be all cracked. Still, it is sturdy and strong. Strong, durable. I recently enjoy climbing trees. That's my hobby. When I see a big, enormous tree that is impossible to climb, nothing can stop me. And the last one was an oak. And I really liked the oak. It had I realized this a long time ago. I just remembered it once again. He even has a small little dry twig. If it were a birch or a linden, I wouldn't even bother with it. On the face of it. Yes, on an oak it's so strong. You hang on it, pull it, and it... Well, it's not for nothing that it's an oak. That's what an oak is for. Yes, that's what an oak is for. They are asking if it is possible to use airships for about a hundred kilometers instead of a bus to the district center, given such a short distance. It can be used, but I think it is impractical. I believe it is impractical if... I... The officer's family don't allow them to do it. I don't think so. Not really. Well, here I can say a little bit. It's a different step than this. I believe that airships in passenger transport... What is important for you? I don't talk about tourism. You want to get from point A to point B comfortably and safely, not just comfortably and safely, but to arrive at a specific time. A dirigible cannot always provide this, and unfortunately, this can sometimes be a problem. Yes, and unfortunately, aviation cannot always provide this either. And the trains are delayed. It is definitely delayed. After all, the train will indeed depart in any kind of weather unless some sort of emergency occurs. The airship, however, is a bit worse off. So, understand that if we talk about tourism, that's one thing. If we talk about flights or cargo, 
that's another. But when it comes to regularity, you arrive at a bus stop and you want the bus to leave at the time indicated, you want to depart at that hour. The main property and quality of a modern airship is questioned. How will new airships differ from old ones? Will it be in all weather capability? No, it will not differ in all weather capability. It will differ in other aspects. Someone mentioned, as an example, how a car from a century ago differs from modern ones. Yes, you know, I can tell you one thing. I have dealt with this as well. It is related to certification. The standards that were applied, that is, no airship, not even one from military times, will currently receive a certificate now. Not a single one, absolutely any at all. It does not meet stringent safety standards. At least two times, or even four. That is, there are formulas, for example, for bending moments, which come into play in turbulent atmosphere. They are completely different now compared to what was used in the 1930s. There are at least two, or maybe I have already forgotten, four times tougher. That is, no airship would absolutely pass certification at all. Of those that used to exist, they would not be allowed now for anything. No Zeppelin would pass. That is to say, they will be much safer now. Because the knowledge about the atmosphere is much greater, and they are becoming stricter all the time. In terms of the design of the airship, it is worse. It will carry less, but it will be safer. Well, then there's the instrumentation equipment, the presentation, yes, the meteorological conditions. I mean, other materials altogether. Well, it's just different materials. The materials that are currently used for the covering of for example, soft airships were unimaginable in the past. That is, it is so strong. Here is the material, and if you take, for example, a pen and insert a very soft fabric, you won't do anything. Even a knife over there can still bounce off a... Well, somehow if... That is, they are so different now. This is evident everywhere. Regarding the materials, I would like to give a brief announcement. We are starting the filming of a large report. We are purchasing all possible test samples and types of various highly supermodern composite materials. Fabric, non-woven and structural. We will be filming a video with additional answers to questions. What will happen if you shoot at it? And if it is filled with hydrogen, does it burn or not? We will fill these bags with Kevlar hydrogen and try to burn them. Let's see what comes of it. We will do everything with junior research staff and other team members. At a serious level, this will not be some kind of toy. In general, we have already started creating such content because there are really many questions. Will it break or not? What if it gets shot? What if a bird crashes into it? In general, all birds, we will not launch birds into it, but we will definitely make simulators, so we will show it. There are tests. A carcass. A goose, I think. Is it shot from a cannon? Yes. About the aircraft's glass. Tests. But what if the aircraft arrives during flight? And then where to the goose? Eat it, perhaps. Well, that's a little trick. If something remains from it, then... What power has the shot? Or do they accelerate it so much it shatters? The goose, but is the windshield intact? Well, to be honest, I don't really know for sure, but imagine if, well, an airplane is flying at a speed of 800 kmh and hits a goose. What would happen to it at that speed? In theory, the goose gaining this acceleration should already spoil by itself. It should lose its integrity. EDK. I haven't eaten. How do you accelerate a goose carcass to such a speed without damaging it smoothly? Oh, about that? No, not really. Well, it can be accelerated. I think it's nothing serious. Well, or in some sturdy polyethylene bag. But how else 
It will just tear if it's shot out of a cannon. No, well, you can accelerate. No, not from a cannon. No need for a jerk. Well, something like that. You know, I was once interested in how much overload a person could withstand. A person? How much do you think? I was not interested. American data is approximately 50 G. What can we compare this to? How many do we have in the car? A couple, three. The coolest G-forces on fighter jets, in my opinion, are 8 G. For the astronaut, when the emergency descent is 12, 14, and that is 50. Can a person endure? No. I believe that during this process, the retina of the eye is gradually and steadily being adapted. Once upon a time, they accelerated something in a highly sophisticated and advanced machine, and there was a very thick, dense layer of vapors. This was specifically for conducting various tests related to space research carried out by the Americans. In the 60s and 70s, there were many various tests conducted there, starting from the fact that, for example, they only consumed coal water or vitamins. Everything was tested. Absolutely everything. If you hadn't said anything, one could joke that they experienced overloads after Rogozin's advice to launch people on a trampoline. Well, yes. Well, I mean to say that it's quite decent. Yes, of course, there can be serious changes with people, but okay, let's get back to the airships. I'll give a little announcement. I already mentioned that in Kirsach, we will be getting to know Arkady from Bowman, who is going to speak. I want to say in Russian that he advocates for airships to be as all-weather as possible, and only then, when they can ensure the regularity and consistency of flights, can they be called modern. We will learn his opinion and listen to what he has to say. Maybe we will hold some debates. In general, stay tuned, guys. We are just getting started, and the most interesting things are ahead. There are so many questions related to our internal matters. Let's say questions about shares, the economy, and so on. Everything related to personal accounts, marketing, and other topics will be addressed on Tuesday. Today, however, the theme is technology, and we have a specialist with that profile to answer such questions. The rest will be answered on Tuesday. Overall, we had a really cool discussion. I personally enjoyed today's broadcast. Guys, give likes if you liked it. I read and hear that people are definitely enjoying it. Everything is great. On Fridays, we have technical webinars, and on Tuesdays, we have basic ones. If you still don't understand the shares, come to Pavel Filipov. He will absolutely explain everything. In general, we wrapped up in an hour and 45 minutes which is a bit less than two hours as usual. So, if there are no more questions, let me check everything once more on vContacte, and in general, we are ready to wrap up. Once again, please like if you found everything interesting. Judging by the reposts, I see it is indeed interesting. Well, the comments are not loading. Guys, in general, Boris Alexandrovich, it was really cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, guys. Goodbye, everyone. We'll meet in the chat, in the vContact group. Share this webinar post with your friends and acquaintances. Let them watch. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.